Ministry TV presents Monica Pearson, one-on-one. She's a country music legend known for her songs, her voice, and her looks. But there's much more to Dolly Parton than that. She's a savvy businesswoman and philanthropist who is all about family fun at her namesake theme park. That's what I learned when I traveled to Dollywood to go one-on-one -on -one with the iconic star. It's bright and early as people stream into Dollywood for the annual season pass holders and media day. They're jockeying to get the best seat in the house, to learn what's new at the park, but most of all, to see Dolly. And she couldn't wait to see them. Hi there, I kept standing backstage and they kept, I kept saying, can I go now, can I go now? They said, no, they need to announce you. I said, I think they know me. Well, anyway, how are you today? The question is answered with cheers, and Dolly responds with gratitude, especially for her season pass holders. Thank you for being a part of our Dollywood family and for trusting us to create memories for you and your families. You've been great to us all through the years. Give yourself a hand, how about it? <laughs> When Dollywood opened 38 years ago in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, the only other theme parks named for a person were the Walt Disney Parks. And while both share some of the same kind of attractions, the main attraction in Dollywood is Dolly. So tell me, what qualities of you did you build into this park so people would love it the way they do? Well, I hope all of it. I hope they see me in some of everything that we have here. And the people that I work with, my partners, the Hershens, and all the folks that work on the park, all the ones in the development, they're very, they want to make certain that there are pieces of me in all, whether it's the food, the recipes, coming back from my childhood stories they've heard me tell, and just kind of playing off of my personality in one way or the other, because I want people to feel me when they're here. I can't be here all the time, but I want them to feel my essence and my the spirit of me and to know that I'm happy that they're here. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Dollywood. <laughs> I just remember the first day opening, I was scared to death that nobody was going to come. I kept looking at the parking lot, you know, like a kid having a party, you know, and you invite your friends, don't know if any of them show up. That's kind of how I felt then. And when I saw the cars all coming in, I was excited. But of course, it's just been so great. Nobody could ever imagine it being like you know what it has become. But that's because God has put all the right people in all the right places at just the right time. So we have a wonderful crew that have helped me build it all through the years. Five, four, three, two, one. You know, when you think about it, in this area, if it hadn't been for you, in many ways, it would not be providing what it is to people, an opportunity for education, an opportunity to have a really good living. Think about when you were a kid and living here. <laughs> well, I do think about that a lot. I'm very moved by that, very humbled by that, to think that, that in this country, you know, that dreams can come true, that you can come from just right up the road here as a poor little kid, you know, in a family of 12 kids and just regular people just trying to make a living and then here I am back. But that was one of the reasons I wanted to have a park to do something when I started to make it. I thought if I ever did make it, I wanted to bring something back to my home to really, because this was a poor area, always has been, you know, not so much now as it used to be when we were young, because I wanted to be able to provide jobs for people. And we have, you know, the whole, in the whole county. <laughs> We're one of the biggest employees in, uh, to employ people in the state of Tennessee, which makes me feel real proud. Because when we started Dollywood, that was one of the things that I wanted to do for here in this area, was to provide jobs for my neighbors and friends and family. A lot of my family works you know, at Dollywood, either performing or in other jobs as well. But it makes me feel good to know that I've had a part in the growth of the area up here, because this is my home. You know, I love it. I love being a Tennessee girl, and especially a Smoky Mountain girl. Thank you. 
There's a lot of greatness in this county, not just me and Dollywood, but we didn't invent the Smoky Mountains. They were pretty popular before I got here, and so there were millions of people that would come to the Smokies every year. And then Pigeon Ford was not that built up at the time, but then Dollywood, of course, really helped with that. But we really, I just feel like Gatlinburg, Sevierville, Pigeon Forge, and you know, we're just all like a, like a family. We're all in the same thing, and I'd like to feel that I'm part of all that, and that I'm just proud that I've been able to do something great for my people and for all people, not just mine, but anybody that comes here, so. And they come year round, so much so that TripAdvisor named Dollywood the number one theme park in the U.S. that's based on customer reviews. Dolly gives full credit to the staff of almost 4,000 people at the park. People like Tim Berry, who started at the park as a 15-year-old and now is vice president of Human Resources. There has been so much growth in the physical park. Like where we're sitting right now used to be a parking lot. And uh, the place where I started isn't even there anymore because we've you know, torn it down and grown and added. It's more than doubled in size. Uh, you know, it's more than doubled in attendance. Uh, so it's just fun to watch the growth and be a part of that. Why do you think people love Dollywood so much compared to other amusement parks? Because think about it. There were amusement parks in this spot before, but why did this one succeed? I think the difference for Dollywood is the genuine uh, employees that we have. Uh, that's one of the first things that we look for in our employees. They just need to be genuinely friendly. And what that does is reflects Dolly's genuineness. She wants people to experience what she got from the Smoky Mountains and the, the Smoky Mountains inspired her to be who she is and she wants other people to experience that and I think they can through the hosts that we have and, and interact with. The one feature here at Dollywood that I think is really touching is that once you've been here 30 years you get your own place in the park. Tell me how that made you feel. It was really special. And the thing is, it's uh, mine is, is a very common story. We have over 60 signs hidden throughout the park that represent people who have been here 30 or more years. And so I, I'm one of over 60. It's almost like a scavenger hunt to go around and distinguish, well, that's just an ordinary decoration sign, but that's a sign that represents one of our uh, long-term employees. So it's fun to be a part of that and just really honored to be part of the legacy of the park. We have good people. We treat our people well too. We love our people and we want them to know that we care about them. And so many of the people that that started here still work here. A lot of them are retired from here. This is our 38th season and that's amazing. Eugene Naughton is president of Dollywood and he told me Dolly, with the help of others, also invests in the people who work at the park. Like last year, you probably recall, she announced a 100% college paid tuition program called Grow You. So anyone working for us at the park day one is eligible to go back to school cost free and to be able to improve themselves and no strings attached by the way. So if they achieve their four year degree and they want to go work somewhere else, the only requirement is, is we're gonna hug them, wish them well, and ask them to pay it forward wherever they're gonna be. So it's just, it's fun to get a chance to be able to do things like that. What is that thing that Dolly has that makes people gravitate to her? You know, the easy, easiest way to explain it, if you think about the Imagination Library, a lot of people don't realize we're the largest book distributor in the world. We deliver over 2 million books a month to children ages zero to six, right out of a warehouse down the street from my office. And it comes from the book lady, it comes from Dolly. So right there, you begin to have a new generation of people start to really learn who Dolly Parton is and what she represents. And then I grab them into our portfolio and have a wonderful multi-generational experience. So people like me and you, we can come here with our grandkids and have a wonderful time. You hear the entertainment shows in the background, so not everyone has to ride rides to have fun here. 
that can also come enjoy wonderful food, great shopping here, but also great entertainment. Dolly Parton, the rock and roll star? When we return, she gives us the inside scoop on her new rock album and tells us what inspired her to give it a shot. I'm sincere about the project and it's really good. It's some of the best work I've ever done with some of the greatest artists and some of the greatest iconic songs ever. Plus, why she and her husband chose Ring Gold, Georgia to tie the knot some 57 years ago. It's just hard to believe that song is 50 years old, but it has done well. Every you know, every 10 years or so, somebody else comes out with it as a as a hit, or it, we play it again. I'm the only person that's ever had a number one song twice, you know, with the same with the same song. I did it when I had it out first time in the whenever that was 50 years ago, <laughs> and uh, and then when I did Best Little Whorehouse in Texas with the. Uh, Burt Reynolds, it became number one again. Then I had a top 10 song as a duet with, uh, uh, with Vince Gill, and then of course uh, Whitney, and different people keep recording it. So it's just the song that just gonna live on forever, like nine to five, I guess. Fine by me. <laughs> I get my royalties, Lord knows I need the money. You know my famous joke, cause a lot to look this cheap. <laughs> Dolly has parked her tour bus you actually can spend the night at Suite 1986 for a price at the Dollywood Dream More Resort. But don't think she's retiring. I will never retire. I will always rewire, like you said, because every, I reinvent myself as they say all the time. I'm about to do a rock and roll album. I'm gonna be a rock and roll star at 77 years old, which I find, I get a kick out of that. But I'm sincere about the music. I'm sincere about the project and it's really good. It's some of the best work I've ever done with some of the greatest artists and some of the greatest iconic songs ever. Like what? Well, like, uh, Paul McCartney uh, sang with me and played piano on Let It Be and Ringo played the drums. Uh, we got John Fogarty singing with me. We got Stevie Nicks and we got Jan uh, Joan Jett playing the guitar and singing with me. We got all kinds of, we got Elton John and we've just got every, you know, all kinds of great artists. I'm doing a lot of their songs, then they sing with me on them. So we've got, actually we're gonna do like a big box set. There's 30 songs actually that we've recorded. But anyhow, point is, I know what, I seem to know what to do. And when they, when all that a little controversy about the Hall of Fame, when I didn't want to be in it, because I didn't think I had earned that. I just felt like when you say the Hall of Fame, you think it's like uh, who people that spent their whole life in rock and roll, you know? And like I've spent mine in country. I'll take anything they give me in country because I feel I've earned it if they'll give it to me because I work at that. But then I thought, well, if I'm going to get it anyway, I need to do a rock album. I don't want nothing that, you know, that I don't earn. So I'm going to see if I can earn it. So that's kind of why I did the album. Well, I find it interesting because now your voice sounds more rock than it did when you first did I Will Always Love You. Yeah. Well, that's because you grow as you come. But I can still go back, though. Some of my, my favorite music of all is mountain music, old folk, old world music. That's best suited for my voice, you know, for my little natural voice, my, my mountain voice. But uh, through the years, I've, I've just tried to develop and grow into that. And I've through the years, I've strengthened my voice because I never quit singing. And even though I'm not touring, 
when you had mentioned that earlier, I, I never, I just meant I wasn't going to do those long six, eight week tours overseas and stuff. I still perform. I still do like some weekend shows. I do uh, charity shows and I do uh, enough to kind of, you know, get, uh, you know, get that emotion out of me. I love it when I'm out there in front of the crowd. And I can do that anywhere. I just can't really uh, go on tour. I just, that, I've done that. I'm so thankful to God and to you for allowing me to see my little Smoky Mountain dreams come true because I used to always dream about that, living here in the hills, and it's like uh, God has been good to me and so have you, and I just wanted to sincerely from my heart uh, thank you so much for, for everything. I dreamed that I would be a success. I wanted to be a success, and I've always said as a joke, but it's, it's actually true, that I've dreamed myself into a corner because you can't just see, okay, I'm done now. You know, the dreams came true, so there. Uh, you really have to live up to all the things that you've seen, and you have so many opportunities that come from every dream. A new dream comes from that, and a new one from that. So it's just really, it just goes on and on. And I just love to work. I always said, like to, today in our press conference, that I live on spiritual and creative energy, and that just spurs me on. Cause, and I love to work. I love what I do. I never did it for the money. I always wanted to make a lot of money, but I would still be doing it if I was just working as a waitress, saving my tips to do a demo, to send it to Nashville with some of my songs. Surely I would. It's just that I've been blessed and I'm grateful for it. And I just, I just love working. The other love of her life is her husband, Carl Dean. They got married in Ringgold, Georgia, almost 57 years ago, for a good reason. Well, because I'm from Georgia, I have to say, y'all got married in Ringo, Georgia? We got married in Ringo because we had planned a wedding. And uh, the reason that we went to Ringo, because I didn't want it in the Tennessee papers that we got married, because uh, I was had just signed a contract and the record label wanted me to wait for a year to get married because they spent all this money. So I went that weekend and got married to Ringo, Georgia. That's why we went to Ringo. And then a year later, when the guy, everything was going really good, the head of the label said, see, ain't you glad you, you know, you didn't get married because things are going so well. I said, I got married the same weekend you told me not to. You've always been sassy. Well, I didn't, wasn't doing it to be sassy. I was in love. And I thought, well, we're not going to, I'm not going to let somebody else dictate that. I knew that love could only help me. You know, I wasn't gonna like let the business, you know, just like I never do now. I never let business take over what's, what I feel right in my heart and in my soul. And that, that love was real. When we return, while you'll never catch Dolly on a ride at Dollywood, and she shares one of her favorite foods to eat at the park. My personal favorite is not a recipe of my own. We even talked about it when I did, when I did my Christmas special from here. Then the legendary rock band Foreigner says farewell. I go one-on-one -on -one with lead singer Kelly Hansen before the band gives Atlanta one last show. When I was a little girl, these uh, things here were exactly what I used to dream about. All these bears, all these butterflies, all these bees and frogs, because we were just part of nature, just being country kids. And I used to pretend like I was flying out of the holler, flying to different parts of the world to see what was out there beyond the holler. And of course, I finally was able to spread my wings and explore the whole world. And no matter where I go, I always take my family and the Smoky Mountains with me. Dolly has dripped big her whole life, and she's not stopping now. We're going to have new dreams all the time. We've got several more resorts that we hope to build and a campground at some point. 
and we'll continue to build rides and areas. We're continuing buying properties around here. We still have a lot of land that we haven't developed yet. So every year we get together and we brainstorm and we dream and we come up with, with the right things. So as you can see, our dream is doing good. I ask God to bless everybody that's, you know, that I work with and, uh, and to bless me as well. So, so far we're doing all right. You know, the other big thing that uh, we have opening this year is Heart Song Lodge and Resort. I am really excited about that. It looks a little muddy up there now, don't it? Construction, and I hate a mess, but it ain't going to be a mess for long. Dollywood sights, sounds, and smells grab your senses. There's the cinnamon bread, the fudge. Whatever you have a taste for, it's there. Dolly's favorite food? Well, we have all sorts of great things. We actually have a lot of recipes. The stone soup people love at the restaurant, but my personal favorite is not a recipe of my own. It's the funnel cakes. We even talked about it when I did when I did my Christmas special from here. Uh, every, we talked about the funnel cakes two or three times, and now they can't keep them. You know, because now everybody wants to try funnel cakes. But they're just good and fun. But all the food is good here. And at the resort, at the Dream More Resort, we have top a top shelf and I mean the food here, people come from all over the county to eat at our restaurant, not just the guests that come to the park. But it's just really, it's just really good. The roller coaster Big Bear Mountain opens in May. It's 3,990 feet in length with a waterfall, turns, and tunnels, and it hits a top speed of 48 miles per hour. And there's even more. It was still under construction in March. Now, y'all know as well as you know my name, I'm not going to be riding that thing. Because <laughs> I don't ride the rides. I always want to say I don't want my hair to fly off right on national television or something. I got tickled today when you said you're not getting on the roller coaster because you didn't want to lose your hair. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. And there's several things. I don't, I don't like to ride the rides. Everybody knows that about me. In the early days, uh, you know, I had to, and I thought, I ain't doing this because it, I, I, get, I have a tendency to have motion sickness too. And then I'm a little bit claustrophobic. I don't like to be, you know, closed in. And I just think, well, I just have too much to lose. I just make a joke of it, you know. But my boobs could fly out, my hair could fall off. <laughs> Any number of things could happen to me <laughs> on those rides. So no point in having that, like I said, on national television, is there? No. No. But there is one ride Dolly loves. When she's in the park at the end of the day, she is a one-car parade. The DeWitt is loaded with flowers. The sidewalks are loaded with people, young and old, sometimes six rows deep, just to get a glimpse of Dolly. They wave their hands, display their homemade signs to tell Dolly how much she's loved and appreciated. And she responds with waves and smiles, hoping everyone had an experience they won't forget. And she knows how she wants them to remember her. Well, I want to be remembered as a good person, a person that tried to, to do good, try to make the most of every good thing I was given, every, all my talent. But I'm very proud of the Imagination Library, uh, where we give books to children. I think that'll be as big a part of my legacy as my songwriting and, and my singing. I just want to, I just want to be remembered. <laughs> so hopefully for a whole lot of things. Dolly Parton will not be forgotten because of her music and her big heart. Her rock and roll album comes out this fall. While Dolly has no plans of retiring, the rock band Foreigner is getting ready to kick off their farewell tour right here in Metro Atlanta. Coming up, lead singer Kelly Hansen tells us what fans can expect as they say goodbye. For this farewell tour, we came up with a new idea where we would have youth acapella choirs open the show. 
the winner's gonna get voted on, and the winner's gonna win a, a PA system from Bose, and, every, and we contribute money to the choirs because that's the, one of the reasons we started doing this was to raise awareness about the lack of funding in school music programs. Plus, we take you back to the sights and sounds of Dollywood. You're as cold as ice You're willing to sacrifice our love The band Foreigner has been around since 1976, with Kelly Hansen as their lead vocalist since 2005. Foreigner's no foreigner to the music charts, with five of their albums going multi-platinum and 14 singles reaching the top 20. You'll hear those songs when they take the stage in Alpharetta this summer. But right now, it's time to go one-on-one -on -one with Kelly Hansen. So Metro Atlanta is going to be your first stop after your Las Vegas residency. Correct. Why Atlanta? Well, you know, I think when you're putting together a tour, you, you try to put together these anchor points, and then you connect the dots to create a tour. And there's so many factors that go into it, uh, enabling uh, the minutia of a tour with multiple buses and trucks and all that kind of stuff connecting all around the country. Like we have two rigs that we use. Um, so you sometimes those crisscross, because sometimes we'll play on the East Coast and the next day we gotta play on the West Coast and the truck would never get there. So this happened to be a good place to start, to be able to anchor us in this position and start off on this side of the country. So have you performed in Atlanta before as oh, foreigner? Yeah, sure. So tell me about that. What is it you like about the Atlanta audience? Well, I always, uh, the places that we play here are usually kind of outdoor places, which is always nice in the summertime. And uh, even though sometimes it can get really hot, I'm a hot, you know, uh, temperature person. So I like that, uh, which is funny considering I have a place in England, which is not hot. Um, but uh, it's always a great crowd here. There's great food here. Everyone's really warm and friendly, and, and I really like that. So when you talk about food, I know you are a foodie. Yes. And I know you know you won a contest for your <laughs> cooking. But what kind of food do you really enjoy when you're at home and kicking back? Well, uh, kind of like I am in regards to music or or the arts or movies or literature. I, I'm not a favorites type of person, but I like appreciating something for what it is on its own. And so I like to jump around uh, different food categories and ethnicities and styles and because uh, I enjoy the whole process of it. So um, in fact, it makes it better for me to move around because I don't get stuck in one place. So I don't have a, like a favorite thing. Um, there are things that I make. I make a bolognese a lot. I'll, I'll do all kinds of different chicken dishes and Mexican food, or, uh, Asian stuff. So I just jump around a lot. I like I like all the things individually. So do you get you some southern fried chicken when you hear? <laughs> you know what? That's something to consider. I hadn't I've thought about that, but that might be something I, I might do. Yeah. Because you know, southern food, when you're talking about being in the south and in Georgia, sure. southern food with sure. collard greens and all that. Sure. Yeah. Well, I eat very little, so. <laughs> Why do you eat very little? Uh, it's that old metabolism, you know. I gotta get in my tight jeans every night on stage, so. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel when you're doing your songs and the audience sings along? That's pretty amazing. Um, and many times I don't hear them all the time, but I, if I watch something on YouTube or, or see a playback of someone filming from the audience, you can really hear the audience sing along. But I have these uh, special uh, molded earphones that are like headphones that I get my mix in. So I'm he hearing a full resounding mix. So sometimes I don't hear the people, but there are other times where it's absolutely evident. We played in Bulgaria for the first time and, and they sang every song from top to bottom and that was kind of wild. Makes you feel good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when I was learning about you, um, Mick said that he started the group, he wanted to be a combination of British rock, R&B, and blues. Right. How would you really define the music of Foreigner? I think it is a blend of those things, but in particular, um, because there is a very English rock sound and there's a very American rock sound, I like just, for example, Southern rock, you know, it's very uh, different than an English sounding rock. Uh, but the, the R&B part, I think, is kind of what Mick is in here, kind of like what I am in here too. 
And when you can blend those together and then create arrangements, which are the parts that the instruments play, they're not always playing the same thing. It's an intricate tapestry of uh, musicality that's unique in this band. And one of the things I've always loved about this band is that uh, the arrangements are so particular and so special. Fans young and old are part of the sellout crowds at Foreigner concerts. When we return, Kelly tells me how they continue to gain fans that span multiple generations. Foreigner has sold more than 80 million albums worldwide, and their fan base is diverse and multi-generational. Yeah, I think that's partly because a lot of song placements in movies and commercials and TV shows like Stranger Things or Orange is the New Black or Glee or all kinds of st uh, stuff uh, has, a, has made people aware of the band when maybe they didn't, and then they'll go to the, to the internet and they'll find the catalog and go, oh, there's some great songs here, and, and I know that the, some of the, the younger people that are coming to the shows know the words, and so they're not just being dragged there by their parents. They, they, they know the words, and that means they're listening to the song. Well, when I was growing up, my mom always used to listen to the pop radio station. Uh, As she radio. drove her GTO. That's right, and, <laughs> and, I, I, you know, and, and she would always have on the, the pop songs. And um, so a, as a singer, some people might not know this, but as a singer, sometimes you, you hear bands differently. I always thought of a singer as being a singer in front of a band, like Frank Sinatra, or, you know, or like Ella Fitzgerald, or some, something like that, rather than a band of members that are all equally in the thing together. And it wasn't until I started singing in a band where I started to understand that, but all of my stuff before that was hearing singers in front of a band. That's how I perceived it. So, uh, you know, uh, all my early stuff was a lot, there was that pop stuff, then there was a lot of R&B stuff. My dad liked to play blues stuff. My mom and dad used to have a collection of albums with Ramsey Lewis or, or whoever it was. And um, I remember them going to parties. And they, what they used to do back in the days, you, they used to leave the house with a bunch of albums under their arm that they would take to the party. And then when they're having their party, they would play, everyone would play their, all their albums and stuff. So I remember that, and that was kind of the early thing in my head. So what is the Southern rock and the R&B you listen to? Well, I listen to a lot of 70s stuff, uh, and I listen to a lot of, uh, I, lost, I listen to a lot of like combo jazz stuff from the 50s and 60s, because I just, it's what I like. Um, I don't like stuff that's too complicated. Um, and I like stuff that I'm familiar with, so I'm not analyzing it. But part of the part of the problem with being a musician sometimes is when you hear something new, you're analyzing it rather than just enjoying it. And if I place some old Aretha or something that I, that I know, I don't have to analyze it. I can just be in it. Okay, so that makes me think, can you really relax with music at home? I can. When I'm cooking too, I like that a lot. You know, I'll just, I'll put on, I put on a lot of old stuff. That could, stuff that I grew up with or stuff that I know and, and uh, Okay, you once said that cooking is similar to writing songs. How? Well, if you think about it, think of it this way. Um, your pots and pans are your instruments. Your um, ingredients are your melody and lyrics. And you can put combinations together to create a beautiful song. And in that way, it's the same kind of creative style but you don't have a record company breathing down your neck and you don't have pressure of having to please, you know, thousands of people. It's just, it's just, you know, a fun thing to do, but it is very similar in that way. So now I'm gonna play with you, okay? All right. First question, what part of performing on the road makes you feel hot-blooded? <laughs> okay. And ice cold. Okay, all right. Um, well, obviously, temperature would have to factor in. I mean, sometimes when we're playing in the summer, in the South, uh, in August, and if the sun is not completely down yet, and the humidity is up, humidity is good for singing, but um, it can be very, very tough on those really hot days. Uh, so I, tr I tend to try to find ways to dress on stage where, I'm, where it's lighter for me, because I'm putting out a lot of energy, I'm moving around a lot, the, the pure act of singing high energy, you know, rock songs, it really does work up your blood pressure and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but we've done some very, very cold shows. I'll give you an example. We played, first of all, we played at the foot of Mount Iger in Switzerland. That was really cool. And then we also played on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls <laughs> on New Year's Eve. Oh no. In the rain. So you want cold as ice? That was cold as ice. Wow. How did you determine that you knew what love was? <laughs> Well, being that I just got married at 59, almost three years ago, um, I think there was, I never really understood until it was just right. And there isn't a, there isn't a questionnaire you can fill out. There isn't um, a magic thing to, that tells you when it's right. But then all of a sudden, sometimes you just know. And I think that's why it's so magical and why everyone's trying to always find it. So did you propose with her with, uh, I've been waiting all my life <laughs> for no. a girl like you? <laughs> no, uh, actually we were on the phone. She was making tacos. <laughs> and I proposed to her like that. <laughs> you are too funny. Where's the romantic here? Well, you know, it was, it was during the early part of COVID and so uh, we weren't actually together, so. Ah, so I call retirement rewirement. Okay. So you all have said, this is really gonna be it. Right. You're gonna go to Europe in 24 and finish up here through 23 and then head off to Europe. Right. What does rewirement look like for you? Well, I mean, I have a lot to do before I get to that place. Um, I have a lot of shows I gotta perform. I have a lot of things I have to do, but I, what I do want to, uh, with my wife and my family figure out what our next chapter is um, and come up with those um, those answers because um, when I've been on the road doing this for almost 20 years nine months out of the year uh, away from home and uh, so there, it doesn't give you a lot of chance to plan out the next place and if um, but I want to spend more time living my life because um, there are different types of people on the road. There are people who are like road people who like, that's what gets them, makes them happen, is they have to be on the road doing it. It makes, it makes their world complete. And I, I have other passions, other things I like to do, and, and, I, and I want to live life, and I want to make sure that I do it wisely and give myself time and not wait too long to where things are too difficult. What are those passions other than cooking? Um, I, um, I, I'm a motorcyclist, and I like to work on those and, and, uh, and old cars and things like that. Um, uh, and uh, I like, it's, it's, it, I call it the, 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 what is it, you call it the, um, the pride of home ownership. I like to actually fix things around the house and do things, and uh, so I enjoy doing that. And I always don't have enough time to do it, and I really hate having to pay someone else to do it. <laughs> There's a cheap side of you. <laughs> No, that's frugal. Yeah. That's frugal. Yeah. So um, when I think of rewirement for you too, because everyone knows you like this, mm. would you ever consider cutting your hair? Sure, I think I would, yeah. In fact, I'm due for one really bad right now. I've, <laughs> I've been away from my, from my stylist for a while. So uh, yeah, I would. And at, you know, I'm in, I'm in this kind of uh, very interesting place. I'm not so well known that people stop me and walk walking down the street most places but I'm I'm not not known at all so I'm in this magical middle place I, I say coming up how Kelly got his start in the business plus giving back through music education the contest that will land some lucky Metro Atlanta students a spot on stage with foreigner this summer Kelly is doing what he loves now, but that wasn't always the case. You know, I found out in reading that you started out singing when you were 17, mm -hmm. and that, you know, you really didn't think that was gonna be your life. <laughs> right, right, well, I, um, I, because I started singing accidentally with a, with a friend who had a band, and he asked, and he asked me to uh, sing with him. We were on the beach and so he always brought the guitar so we sang on the beach and he asked me to come sing with his band and a couple months later I was the lead singer of the band. And I was at a time where I didn't know what I wanted to do after I got out of high school and I was really struggling and starting to panic about what am I going to do. 
And I fell into this and I said, wow, it's, it seems that I have some type of ability to do this. So it was just kind of um, happenstance. So I got to know, growing up in Hawthorne with, you know, a beach boy living up the street. Right. Did you ever meet him and try to sing with him? No, but the funny thing is, is that um, we just did a gig. Uh, I think it was the beginning of last year. It was a, a private show that we did up at the top of a mountain in, in Malibu um, uh, with Beach Boys. Oh, come on. So I uh, got to meet Mike Love. and, and uh, But uh, that's something I never would have thought of when I was younger. That was just completely out of out of my spectrum. One thing that is not out of his view is the need to support music in schools with the Grammy Foundation. For many years, we've been working with the Grammy Foundation and, and prior to COVID, we would have a lot of youth choirs come on stage and sing with us during I Wanna Know What Love Is, which was really, really great. And when COVID came along, we couldn't really do that anymore. We couldn't have a bunch of teenagers on stage and I don't wanna get sick and have to throw, you know, 30 people And you out don't wanna get them sick. Yeah, right. So. Um, but for this farewell tour, we came up with a new idea where we would have uh, youth a cappella choirs submit uh, videos of themselves to the local radio station, and a couple of them, a couple of them are going to come and open the show, uh, and then uh, because we're going to be playing with Loverboy, and so they're going to come on before Loverboy, and then the audience is going to somehow we're going to figure out how the get, the winner is going to get voted on. And the winner's gonna win a, a PA system from Bose, which is really great. And every and we contribute money to the choirs because that's the, one of the reasons we started doing this was to raise awareness about the lack of funding in school music programs. And when, and when budgets get cut, that's the first thing that they cut. So we wanna give them a little bit of money, raise a little bit of awareness. Uh, they get to have, uh, I get to see their faces when, when they're on stage and I get notes and emails and texts from uh, band directors or choir directors and parents saying you know how much it meant to their kids and it's been really I think we get the better end of the deal on it so but I wanted to make sure everyone knew about that and that's going to be happening during that whole uh, Live Nation tour. So you talked about the importance of music education in schools. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the state of music as it is now and looking at the different genres mm -hmm. where do you see a need well, I would like to see more of an emphasis on being good at what you do rather than being famous for what you do. And um, it's too easy now to make a record in your bedroom with not very much talent. It's a lot harder to really be good at what you do and pound the pavement and pay your dues and really understand when you get a break how valuable that is and how you need to treasure it like I've had in my life. I've been around the block a few times and I've been really, really fortunate as all the guys in the band have been. We understand how rare and valuable that is. And so I think that's really the only way you can appreciate it. Plus I think that there's um, the music uh, making now is far more tech technological than it used to be. Uh, so I think that that's uh, something that would be really helpful to be able to understand the technological part of it. Farewell Tour starts in Metro Atlanta in July and will end in Europe in 2024. The travel and the singing can take a toll on Kelly's tenor voice, but he's learned how to protect it. Well, there's a, it, it takes a lot of mental uh, work on my part because I have to make sure that the show is the apex of each day and that I don't stay up late telling rock stories, you know, uh, in a bar somewhere and I can't yell too loud, I can't laugh too loud, I really have to take care of my voice. So my on-tour speaking um, style is different than my off-tour speaking style. Um, I have to sometimes tell people, listen, I'm, I'm not angry with you, but the atonal sound of my voice is just me saving my voice. So, because uh, sometimes people can think that I'm somehow not happy or, or not excited about something. Well, one thing I learned about you in your research is that your scarves, and you are wearing one today. Wearing two. Two, are your saving grace, explain that. Well, I, I usually have a, a scarf or two with me on the road because um, 
there's so many temperature changes that happen when you're traveling. If you go on an airplane, when you get on, sometimes it's really, really hot. And then when you get up in the air, it's really, really cold. So um, I can uh, take the scarf off when it's hot and I can wrap the scarf around me so I breathe in warm air uh, when it's cold. And that really helps me because I don't like to have uh, air blowing uh, down my throat. That's, that dries you out. But isn't it also a good way when you're on a plane to be incognito? <laughs> well, it's a great way to be able to fall asleep snoring without people taking pictures of your open mouth. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new thing they're doing on flights now is they're announcing that um, you, you can film and take photos, but if you're going to include anyone else, like the crew or anyone else in the plane, you have to ask their permission. They're doing that in the, in the announcements uh, at the beginning of flights now. And after 28 years of singing the same songs, how does Kelly keep it fresh? It all depends because there are a, a large amount of variables from night to night, even though we're playing a similar set of songs. Um, and those can affect how I feel the song that night. Like, is it a big crowd, small crowd, indoor, outdoor? Uh, is, it, is it warm or is it cold? Uh, is the stage made of wood and makes it sound really good? I really love a wood stage, it's my favorite. Um, or do I have a particular mix that night that sounds really good to me? Um, all of those things can change how a song feels from night to night. So one night, a, this song might feel really good. The audience really is with us on it. Another night, it might be another song. But I just like to say that I, I see these songs as a, a beautiful basket of fruit. And I uh, am very fortunate to be able to choose an apple today or pair tomorrow, and, they're, and, they're, and that's this catalog. It's so amazing, and if you're a singer that you couldn't dream this or pay for the opportunity to sing this catalog of songs, I'm very, very fortunate. So it still feels like the first time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> she, I, that was churning away in your mind the whole time I was answering. <laughs> you made it happen. <laughs> Tickets are on sale now for the July 6th Foreigner Concert at Ameris Bank Amphitheater, brought to you by Live Nation. When we come back, more of the milestone celebration from Dollywood. Thank you for joining me, and I hope you'll join me every Sunday at 8 p.m. on Peachtree TV for Monica Pearson One-on-One, -on -one, where you get to know the person behind the celebrity. I want to thank the folks at Dollywood for their hospitality. I made this trip 38 years ago to talk to Dolly when the park first opened, and I was amazed to see how much the park has grown over the years. The celebration at Dollywood continues with the Flower and Food Festival going on now through June 11th. It's springtime in the Smokies with more than a million marvelous balloons, unique foods, and whimsical shows. Now we leave you with more sights and sounds from our adventure at Dollywood. <laughs> In Dollywood, welcome to Dollywood. The theme is I Will Always Love You. It's the 50 year anniversary of that song. But when you think about Dolly Parton, you always think about love, what she's done for her community and how people love her, even from the littlest person up to the oldest. Dolly Parton, people always say, I will always love you. <laughs> My question is, are you always thinking about what's next? And how do you handle all of that? How do you juggle it all? I'm on drugs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, actually, I live off of creative and spiritual energy. And I just love what I do, and I just pray uh, that God will lead me and kind of show me what to do. And, and I think anytime you're working on good things, it energizes you. And I don't, uh, somebody say, well, how come you never get old? I said, well, I ain't got time to get old. <laughs>
back then when I did that interview, we, I think we did it in like a little trailer. And I said to you, what do you look like when you don't have on your hair and makeup? And you said, I look like hell. And then you turned around and said to me, what do you look like? And I gave you your answer back. <laughs> Oh, y'all are sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. You're the to you. best. Thank you for being here. No, I'm enjoying this Thank a bunch. Oh, good to meet you too. Have a good day. Ah, y'all. That's interesting. <laughs> we'll get over here behind you so okay, you don't you have can, to move. Can, yeah, I, I've been sitting. You can sit right oh, here. Oh, thank you. And they can get behind us and they can hunker and, thank you. and stoop and squat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> You even smell like oranges. You got your <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Right. You are just adorable. You. you are so sweet. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you all.